Hello everybody, hope you're having a great morning. Um, my name is Jess and we are recording right here at Safe Bay's Exploration Center in Aquarium. Um, so I am an educator here at Save the Bay and right behind this camera here we have Adam Kowarski who's also an educator. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Um, so just as a reminder for those tuning in, we are right here at Save the Bay's Exploration Center and Aquarium. So in our tiny space, all of our animals actually come directly from Narragansett Bay or the surrounding watershed, so really cool to check out. So today we're going to really focus in on some of our very special animals that we have in our aquarium. So these two animals in particular are even different from animals of their same species wild, right? Um, so these animals are actually, they have different mutations, making them humans. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that in just a second. But for those of you who are just joining us, reminder, my name is Jess, and behind that camera there we have Adam, um, and we're going to talk to you all about mutations today. So before we really get into what a mutation is, we have to talk about these things right here. So for those of you at home, you might recognize the structure, it's a very famous structure, it's that double helix shape. This is DNA, it kind of looks like Twizzlers a little bit too. Uh, but DNA is really, really important. It's actually in every single living thing. So that includes me, you, all these beautiful animals in the aquarium, and even things outside like plants, mushrooms, things of that nature. So DNA is the material that carries all the information about how a living thing will look and function. So for example, my DNA tells me that my eyes are going to be brown, I'm going to have these weird shaped fingers, and maybe even how my lungs work and function too, which is pretty interesting. But something happens. Mistakes happen all the time, right? I make mistakes, you might make mistakes. Um, and there's even mistakes in DNA. So these mistakes we call mutations. So if you return your eyes back to our double helix structure, structure up here, you can see that this is a perfectly normal strand of DNA. No mutations whatsoever. But if you look at the one on the right, see how this green line, those are called base pairs, a very simplified base pair today, um, it actually turned brown. So that slight change in DNA um, actually creates a mutation. So that mutation right there, it could either be harmful, beneficial, or have no effect whatsoever. So we're going to kind of do a deep dive in why these things are so important. Because mutations are actually really critical for all of our organisms and ecosystems all around the world. So to better explain that, I drew this little demonstration. Um, so you can see right here in the middle, this is my beautiful fish. It has no mutation, so we call that the wild type. Um, so it's got this big beautiful fin that helps it swim really fast in Narragansett Bay. But then over here, we have this little guy, this little chunker, he actually has a harmful uh, mutation. The reason we call it harmful is because do you see how much smaller that fin is than our wild type or fish with no mutation? So this little fin might not allow our fish to swim as fast. He might not be able to catch food as well. He might not be able to avoid predation. So he might get eaten. So chances of him passing on those, that DNA to offspring is a little less likely. But then. Over here, we have our beneficial mutation. So you can see that fin is just a little bit bigger than our wild type or with no mutation. So this guy can swim a little bit faster, he can find food a little bit better, and he can avoid those predators a little bit better. So chances of him living longer are much higher. Um, chances of him uh, spreading on those DNA to his offspring are much higher as well. So over time, what happens in different populations is that harmful uh, mutation is actually removed from the population due to natural selection. So uh, this guy's not living longer, he's not mating as much, things of that nature. And this beneficial mutation is more prevalent in the populations. So without these beneficial mutations, um, we would have no evolution actually. Because if we just remained here in the middle with this wild type never changing, we would never evolve. We would never evolve against those environmental pressures um, and making us better overall. It's really interesting. So if you guys are ready, we're actually going to get to meet two of our mutants today. So Jess, yeah. uh, we have a question here from Lexi. She wants to know, how does the mutation tell you 
if he's har- if he's harmful. It doesn't make sense to me. She's she wants a little more clarification. Ah, oh, gotcha. Um, so it doesn't mean he's harmful, right? It doesn't mean that he might bite you and he might be a little bit ferocious. What it means is it's harmful to that organism or that specific fish. So by this fish having a shorter tail, it's actually not so great. He might not live as long as we were talking about with that beneficial one. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you, Lexi. But great question. Thanks for making me clarify that one a little bit more. Um, Beautiful. So before we meet our first animal with a mutation, I want to paint a picture for you. So this animal that we're about to meet is an American lobster. So if you close your eyes and think about your ideal image of an American lobster, I normally think of those bright red lobsters, but that's a lobster after it's freshly cooked. So these lobsters, before they're cooked, they have all sorts of different colors. They have browns, greens, blues, oranges, you name it, they pretty much have it. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this lobster and we are going to see how it might differ from that beautiful colors of those browns, those greens. So just as a reminder, my name is Jess, and we have Adam behind the camera, and we're right here at Save the Bay's Exploration Center and Aquarium. So all these animals that you get to meet in there um, actually came from the bay. So let's go check this guy out. So we're right here at our rocky shore exhibit. You can tell there's all these beautiful rocks and even some fish swimming around at the top, if you guys can check that out. But I don't see a lobster, do you guys? So in order to get this guy to come out of his cave, I'm gonna throw in some jumbo mycie shrimp. You can see it right here. So of course then, sea robin is coming out and definitely trying to take all of that mycie shrimp, but eventually that American lobster might be tempted to come out. Adam, are you starting to see him? Yeah, we could see him right now, Jess. He just popped his head out here. Beautiful. So my friends, if you are looking at that American lobster, remember I said that normal American lobsters without mutations are kind of those browns and greens and blues. But look at this guy, bright orange. So this guy has what we call a color morph mutation. So all of those beautiful pigments, those browns, greens, blues, yellows, oranges, are almost not expressed. The only one that is, is that orange color. So many of you at home might have heard of a blue lobster, um, even a calico lobster. So it's that same mutation. The blue lobster is actually a little bit less rare than this guy. One in two million lobsters have that blue coloration of a blue lobster, but this orange one is about one in 30 million. Super rare. But the rarest of all is the albino lobster. So that's one in 100 million. It's really beautiful. If you have access to a computer, definitely Google it because it's really beautiful. It's almost like this iridescent blue. We got a question from Stephanie. Sure. She wants to know, does Save the Bay have any blue lobsters and why are some lobsters blue? Oh, great question, Stephanie. Um, So we actually used to have a blue lobster, um, but with everything in this aquarium, we try to release it after about a year. Uh, So once we got this beautiful yellow lobster, he actually came from a stop and shop, believe it or not. Um, An environmentalist was wandering around looking at those lobsters and saw this guy's really stick out. Um, So they actually got that lobster and brought it down here to us. Um, But our blue lobster we had for about a year and then we released back into Narragansett Bay. So hopefully it's doing really well out there. Um, And same thing with this orange lobster, Stephanie, is it's that color morph mutation. So just that blue is expressed and all those other colors are nice and diluted. All right, so Lexi wants to know, is that a baby stingray? Probably referring to one of the fish that just swam by. Oh, yes. So was it swimming like a magic carpet, Lexi? If so, that is our flounder. So it kind of does look like a stingray or a skate. And we see it over here. Let's see. Oh, it's so well camouflaged, I can't even see it. All right, is that it, Lexi? Beautiful, so that is our flounder. So we're gonna do a lesson on that, hopefully soon, so you get to see and learn more about those. Um, But going back to our lobster down there, if we can still see it, um, our orange lobster, just American lobsters in general, they're actually very special. So I don't know if you got to see his claws poking out earlier. Let me try throwing some more shrimp in there and get it to come out. All right, so Jess is going from the top of the tank now. She's gonna toss some more shrimp in. You can actually see it coming down. 
Oh, that flounder came out. No, to nice. Tog, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, we're gonna see. Oh, there he comes. Oh, here he is. You guys see him? He's snapping. Yeah, so he's got those two very specialized claws. He's basically got built-in silverware. Um, so on the right side, you can see that really huge smasher. Um, so that basically can crush anything that this lobster wants to eat. And then on the left side, that claw's a little bit thinner. So that's almost like the fork and knife. Um, these guys are scavengers, so they're all around the bottom of the bay looking for things, really whatever they can find. So they're eating fish, they're eating other crabs, um, all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Whatever they can get their claws on. So Chris wants to know, do the different color lobsters taste any different? Ooh, um, to my knowledge, Chris, I do not believe that they do. So actually when this lobster is cooked, um, that orange pigment goes away and turns red, just like all those other um, lobsters with that brown and greens and stuff like that. The only one that doesn't turn red when it's cooked is that albino lobster. I don't know what color that one turns. Maybe white, I don't know. <laughs> We'll have and to look that up. So Mackenzie wants to know, does this lobster have a name? Oh, you know what? We don't name, we didn't name this lobster just because any of our permanent residents um, pretty much get a name, but this guy's not going to be permanent. He's going to be released back into our bay. Um, but the next resident we're going to meet for sure has a really beautiful name. Great <laughs> question, Mackenzie. Um, beautiful. Just another couple quick facts about American lobsters. They actually don't have any set lifespan or size they can reach. Um, so these guys can live to be well over a hundred years. It's really hard to date them though because they have that beautiful exoskeleton that they have to molt or shed off in order to grow. And that's got a lot of great information about age. So when you see a really, really big lobster, chances are it's a little bit harder to tell how old it is. So Lexi wants to know, Jess, uh, is this lobster a girl or a boy? Oh, great question, Lexi. Um, it's really hard to tell with lobsters, not as easy as with crabs. Um, so if you remember to some of those crab videos, um, girl crabs have that beautiful circle or basketball shape. Um, tail flap and then males have that rocket ship. With lobsters you can only tell by a group of appendages called swimmerettes. So females have a little bit rounder swimmerettes um, where males have a little bit pointy. So we would have to take this lobster out, flip it over to determine if it's a boy or a girl. It's a little bit harder to tell. But great question Lexi. Quick note, Chris has had a hard time dating lobsters as well. Oh yeah, I bet Chris. <laughs> Alrighty my friends, so if you're ready, we can move on to meet our next um, animal with a mutation. So this might be one of our most famous residents in the aquarium that has a name like Mackenzie was wanting to know. You guys ready to meet him? Come on over. Alrighty my friends, so I'm just gonna step right on up here so we can get face to face with Bowser, who is our common snapping turtle. So he looks super big and super prehistoric, but guess what? He's only eight years old. And while he's here, while he's swimming right in front of us, I wanna to talk to you about his mutation. So Bowser actually has what's called polydactylism, which means many fingers. So if you look on this left hand right there, it looks a little bit funky, right? It's a little bit different than his right. So his right one has five claws, just like we have, or fingers, just like we have. His left has two extra, so he has seven fingers on his left side, making him a mutant turtle. So he's not quite a teenager, so we can't call him a teenage mutant ninja turtle quite yet, um, but soon hopefully we can. So snapping turtles can live to be well over a hundred years old, which is really crazy. Um, so he's only eight, so he's got a lot of growing and life left in him. Um, so Bowser is actually just upgraded to a brand new tank. Um, so the students of Meadowbrook Elementary actually got this tank. They did a lot of great deeds, raised a lot of money, um, so he can actually get bigger. So before we moved him in here in December, he actually weighed about 13 pounds. We haven't weighed him since, so he can definitely get much bigger. The largest snapping turtle, that's a common snapping turtle, is actually about 90 pounds, so Bowser's got a lot of growing left to do. If you guys want, I'm gonna try to throw in some pellets for him. Um, he's eating today some Reptamin, just 
the turtle pellet, lots of great nutrients in there for him. He's not a very good eater. That's part of the reasons he's one of our permanent residents. You see all these fish in here? They were intended to be his food, but he's not very good at hunting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw in some pellets. He may or may not eat, but we might get the chance to see his powerful jaw in motion and that really long neck of his. So Steph is asking, Stephanie's asking, will he eat the fish in the tank with him? Oh, great question. So that was our initial intent. Oh, there you go. So you can see that powerful jaw in play. Oh, moving closer, Jess. Yeah, absolutely. Come on in. Um, but he's a little bit too slow to catch them. Sometimes these fish go after those reptomen pellets too. Um, and that's when he notices them and tries to hunt for them. Um, but not all the time is he really successful in that. But yeah, you can see that powerful um, jaw at play and that really long neck. Oh, look, he's interested in the fish. Maybe not. <laughs> Um, so Bowser was actually found right here on Easton's Beach, which is pretty crazy because he's actually a freshwater turtle and he was found near saltwater, which is not great. Um, so what happened there is there is a reservoir across the street and we think that either there was a big storm and he was hanging out over there um, and he was swept over um, and that outflow onto the beach. So he had a little bit of salt water exposure, a little bit of sand exposure that he's not used to. Um, so we actually took him in about eight years ago um, and we've had him here ever since. So he's going to be one of our permanent residents until he outgrows us. And then hopefully we'll find somebody with a nice big pond that can take care of him. We'll see. But now I want to talk to you guys a little bit about these mutations. Because remember, we learned about harmful mutations and we learned about beneficial mutations. So do we think that that orange color of our lobster might be beneficial or might be harmful? It's hard to tell. Um, we can't really test that in the wild with this guy. But my hypothesis is that I don't know if you guys know this, but at deeper depths, sometimes lobsters can hang out there. They can go up to 1,500 feet deep, which is pretty deep. So at that deep depth, no red light or orange light really penetrates down that far. So that orange lobster could totally disappear and camouflage down at a deeper depth. But if we're in Narragansett Bay and our average depth is about 25 feet, I don't think that he's going to be very well camouflaged, right? I can see him super clearly. He doesn't have those browns, those greens, those blues that really help him camouflage into that rocky shore. So it could be beneficial. It could not be. We're not sure. And then we're taking a look at Bowser's extra fingers. So I don't really know how that would be helpful to Bowser, but it's not harmful necessarily. Um, I know there has been some um, studies with humans that people with extra fingers, like an extra finger or two extra fingers, they can actually do more with those hands if those fingers are, fingers are functioning um, than most people can do. So there's been a study where um, a mother and son, they both have polydactylism, those extra fingers, and they can actually tie their shoelaces with just one hand. I can't do that. I don't know about you guys. Um, so there's definitely some things to keep in mind, um, whether these are harmful or beneficial mutations. So if you guys have any ideas, let us know. I would love to know if you have an idea of whether you think these are beneficial or harmful. So a few minutes back, Jesse wanted to know, why aren't there any turtle friends in with Bowser? Ah, uh, so Bowser is a lone wolf or a lone turtle. Um, so they really only get together when they're mating. Otherwise, they're very territorial. Um, so Bowser is much happier on his own, even though it does look like he's a little bit lonely. Um, he's got his fish friends in here that he won't eat. So I think they keep him a little bit of company, too. Great question, Jesse. Beautiful. Alrighty, do we have any more questions? Uh, we have one more. Sure. Uh, my neighbor has a big pond that leads to a waterfall. Maybe we could put fish in the pond for him uh, for the snapping turtle. Oh, so um, you said there was a snapping turtle in there? Uh, for the, for Bowser. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, so Bowser is actually not eating these fish, right? Um, and these fish were specifically found in Rhode Island. Um, some of them are native, some are goldfish in here. Um, so we only like things that are native um, or that we put in here for Bowser. Um, so adding more things might take up more room, and we're already trying to get rid of some of these fish too. So great question. Thank you for the offer, but I think we're all set. Beautiful. 
beautiful. Alrighty, my friends, if there are no more questions, um, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us at, by, at breakfast by the bay. Uh, just as a reminder, my name is Jess, and that's Adam behind the camera there. Um, and if you like what if you like what you're seeing, please feel free. Uh, there's a link below. You can donate to Save the Bay's ongoing efforts. Um, and just as a reminder, we'll be right back here um, 10 o'clock tomorrow. So definitely check us out. Thanks for staying, guys, and have a great day.